away with the kicker? Yes, I did. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Uh, so cool to see so many people here. And uh, I really hope you like this presentation. I think a few of you were at the UX Open. Anyone that were there? Yeah, okay. So you heard the best part. Like, I had this presentation. I'm like, okay, if I cut out all the crap and make it 10 minutes, that's what you heard. So this is with all the crap. Uh, am I in the way? No. So my name is John Philip. And I work at Avanade as a UX developer. And on a project, I had to do some wireframes. And then I had to live with it, uh, which was kind of tough. I still suffer. Um, if you want to tweet, Sediema uh, JP, so not Sediema, like some people think, apparently. Um, I'll just run right through it. So this is just a bunch of tips, things I learned while first making wireframes and then having to implement them in HTML and CSS and everything. So just like thinking back, like what should what should I've done before, or I should have done it like this, or whatever it is. So without further ado, the first thing. Components. Um, one thing we did is we worked on an e-commerce site and we started doing the little product placements for the products all over the site. Um, we were actually two people working on this and we did it over a span of maybe one, two months. So some things happened here and there and we started doing this and we had like pretty similar stuff and when I was going to implement it in HTML you want to think of reusable components, like you don't want to have to recode everything. Because when you work in Actual or any other wireframing tool, it's really easy to just like click and drag and drop and remake, copy paste, whatever, change a bit. And that's fine. But when you start making it, then it becomes a bit of a hassle. And I was working on this and I was implementing it and I was going to do the other pages. And I was like, ah, oh, cool, I can reuse this. And I look at the wireframe and it's like, what? what is this? Like, it, it has a little... Here it has a skew, here it has something else. Like, what, who made this? Like, why did it make it so schizophrenic? I'm like, oh shit, I made it. Uh, but then we started going through them again and see that, okay, there are a few things that are common, so we can just make it similar and reuse that. Um, that was something we should have done a lot earlier. And you can use, for example, actual masters or something else to make thinking components already and not just copy pasting and, and just doing small changes. So when you do that, something really important is having names for it. And it's quite good if you can come up with a name for it, because development is probably going to take this and implement it. And then they going to invent really weird names. So when you start talking, you're like, something list uh, opener listener. It's like, what, what is that? So if you do it yourself, you can call it user list or article list or whatever you want to have. And kind of make a sense out of it. Um, and then one thing we should have done, like, yeah, we talked about components, but designing a form, just a standard form, like everything that you want to have in a form, because it's easy that you just design pieces of a form when you need them. So now we need an uh, input box for our names, so we'll design that. Later on, you need a checkbox, so you'll design that. We know this was a lot better if you could just go through and do all of them. And in case you need them, then you can grab it. So make masters for all of them, just in case. And that kind of ties into the next topic, which is use existing GUI frameworks. So I know uh, some people are going, boo, bootstrap. Uh, but uh, I actually like bootstrap a lot. And if you don't like the theme, which is fine, because you're probably not going to use it. But it has a sensible markup for the CSS. It has a sensible structure that you can build on. And a lot of companies like Spotify are building on top of bootstrap to make their own things. Uh, this is a bit more implementation-wise, not that much uh, wireframe. But another point to this is that if you're working on a project that has uh, some kind of framework already, like on our project, we actually had an accelerator, like a pre-made web shop, and we kind of just skipped it, and we really shouldn't have. <laughs> uh, so should have just like looked at what was available and tried to use that, and use that already in the wireframes. And that takes me to thinking inside the box. Like we did a lot of, like when you start taking the wireframes and making them into HTML, I don't know, how many people know HTML here? 
Yeah, cool. Uh, do you know Warface as well? <laughs> like, oh shit, wrong, wrong audience. Um, you start thinking that, okay, this has to go into this tag and this has to go into that tag. And you start seeing a pattern that if you create a form, you can't expect the submission button to be inside that form, right? But we did a lot of things like this. So the button outside, but all the styling and stuff around the input, which just looked nice. But when you start doing it, you start to think like, mm -hmm, maybe the button actually belongs inside the box with all the other stuff. And it's just, uh, it's easy to go into the sign land when you're doing wireframes, just do things that look kind of nice. But it's good to step back and try to think that, okay, if I'm gonna do this, does it make sense to put it in here or outside? Uh, so when it comes to wireframes itself, uh, I like to annotate a lot. And one thing we did that worked pretty well was having IDs for requirements. So if we did a specific feature because of a specific requirement, then we would put a, put a, a little note saying that we did this because of this requirement ID. And you can use the fields in Axure for specific ID numbers. The good thing with that is when you generate the Word document, if you do that, uh, a lot of project managers like documents, so it's really nice to be able to just put it out. Then you get like every wireframe, and then you get all the requirement IDs that it fulfills, which was pretty useful for us. Something we did that works for wireframes and prototypes, but doesn't work that well for user, user testing is highlighting links. So in our case, when we did the prototype, we did a few things clickable. So you could click on them and go to some, another page or open up a box or whatever. Um, if you look at this, for example, it's, if, you're, if this is a prototype, you have to do everything manually, right? You need to click on that link and attach it to an event. And you might not do it for all of them. But for those that you do, if you do it blue, then it's easier for developers and people using your wireframes as a lookup for requirements. It's easier for them to see what has been implemented or not. And that, that helped us. But then we really did some user testing and that kind of did not work. <laughs> no, it works, but the thing is, then you ask your user, where do you click to go to the next product? And there's three things that are blue. Then they're like, ah, probably this one. Uh, so, yeah, that's something to think about. Something we noticed that we didn't do that we should have done uh, is have something really highlighted when it's a CMS component or CMS part. And what I mean about that is an area that is supposed to be attached to some kind of CMS system that the client can just go in and edit the text. Because there's, there's uh, for example, in an e-commerce site, the product description and everything comes from the product, comes from the system and manager's products. You don't just go in and edit them for the site, but the site could have like a FAQ, contact us, stuff like that, that is different and that should be edited separately. It, it's mostly for developers to know that this area is not just some localized text area. This is actually connected to some CMS. Uh, and that is something we cannot fail at. And when it comes to mobile, um, pop-ups, how many like that on mobile? I know I love implementing them, because when you do that, there's always somebody about, ah, but on my Samsung X3, 4, whatever, if I try to scroll, it doesn't work. It's like, oh, because it's a pop-up. Uh, so try not to do that, that is really annoying a lot of times, it's easier to just make it a separate page or something else. Um, you can usually design it as maybe it drops down a bit, we did that at a few places, that when you want to change the quantity of a product, it drops down and you can change the quantity over there. Or we just made a whole new page or something else. And then you have types, there's something to think about when you do uh, for example, forms or forms, <laughs> uh, something similar that uses it. Uh, for example, radio buttons might look fine on the desktop, but when it comes to mobile, it might look better if you have a select drop down because you get this nice little interactive scroll list. It might be easy to touch on that instead of touching on the radio buttons. Could depend. So think about the HTML5 built in input types and how that can affect the user experience. And you have other things that you should think about, like you can specify their numbers 
And then when you go to the, when you click on it, you'll get the number pad on your phone instead of the regular alphabet that you have to change to numbers. So that's something that's really useful as well. So maybe you don't see the difference on the PC, but it can make a difference on, on mobile. And when it comes to responsive web design, uh, it was new, this was new for us. We started almost two years ago, uh, one year and a half. And uh, we started doing like most people do, I think, that you make a design, and then for the other breakpoints, you start designing it a little bit better. Like, and then you start doing like these different, almost different designs. And uh, sure, you can make it work, but it's better if you try to flow naturally. So if you have a few things in a line and you start making it smaller, they will automatically drop down to the next level. And what that means is, in a few cases we had, uh, we had, for example, some information on the right side, which, which kind of makes sense when you have it on a desktop, like you have it on the right, and you're doing things on the left. But when you go to mobile or uh, smaller screens, basically, it goes down. But that was kind of important. That was almost more important than the thing you were seeing on the left. Now, sure, you could make it so that, yeah, on, on this break point, we move stuff around. But if you just take a step back and think maybe mobile first or something, then maybe it makes more sense to have that right thing to the left. <coughs> So it just flows naturally and it makes more sense because you wanted it on top because it was more important. Uh, grids, I know some people have different opinions about this. Most people use grids somehow, uh, have some kind of grid system. We, we use 12 grids because that's easily divisible by three and by four. So you can have three columns or four columns or two. Uh, but what we really noticed, and after doing a few of these wireframes, when we implemented them, we noticed that it's, it was really nice having two, three defined breakpoints. Some people, some tools actually allow you to define new breakpoints every time you create a new page. So like on this page we have these breakpoints because that looks better. On that page we have these. And that's kind of annoying when you have to like sign it and make it work. So we define just a few simple breakpoints, two breakpoints to have big, medium, small, and we, then we design flows. Uh, because what you usually do is you say that this is half width, and when you go down to this size, it goes like this. Or you you always try like if you use Twitter Bootstrap, you use the call span uh, classes all the time, and try to make thinking every time for every breakpoint. So what we did was. We had a few specific flows. So, for example, a uh, quarter width would always be quarter width, quarter width, and then half width on the smallest one. And then we have a quarter width width grow that would grow to a third size. And we had a few specific like flows that we could use. So we could just attach that class, and it would resize in a specific way. So we could make the page flow in a certain way without having to rewrite CSS all the time. Um, any testers here? Any programmers? Ooh. Uh, so we talk about happy path and sad path. And most people are optimists. Otherwise you wouldn't be working in an area where the computer dies all the time and stuff doesn't work and like, frustration every time. Uh, so we usually think about happy paths. Like for example, we make a listing of products. That's a nice little listing. We have our products here. This is nice. So next page. Or, but what if when you, there's no items? Or should it just say no items? Should it say, did you mean something else? Should it say, like, uh, we're sorry? Uh, should it speak in a friendly language? Should it just say error? Because if you don't do anything, the programmers will be like, error database null. And your user is like, what, what did I do? I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, so it's actually quite good to try to define these empty pages. And it's the same with language. Like we made a little menu and it looks really nice. It's really awesome. Uh, and then just like my name, no. Uh, and you, you can do the finish test, just add linen to everything. Cartilinan, menu linen, and it just like, does it still fit? 
Uh, I actually use Google Translate, so if you're in Finnish people, this might be wrong, but you get the point. Like, everything just goes out of the way, and like, don't, don't even get me started on right to left languages. Uh, do we move the icons then? Or like, if Japanese start, things go up to down, like, ah, no, I don't think about it, but sometimes you have to. Um, and then there's alternative paths. So not really happy, sad, but it's alternative paths. For example, if you just have a regular listing, and you have some price, but then there's a requirement. People that aren't logged in aren't supposed to see the price. So then you need a version of the page with those changes. And it, it, sure, that's obvious, right? But in our case, this was a requirement that came in the middle of the project. So then we're like, okay, whoa, <laughs> what happens now? Uh, so that can be something to think about from the beginning, like, will we have these things? Start asking the clients, will we have cases where we'll need to hide or show different things on different pages? Uh, when it comes to organize, uh, we were pretty good at this, I think. We, we did some unique names for every wireframe. So every wireframe was a page and then I had a unique ID. And we had some, some post fix, for example, WF for wireframe and WFM for wireframe master, or user flows like UIF, just something like that. But then we didn't go that creative with the numbers. We started kind of crea creative, like everything started on zero, one was the checkout. But what if you do more than 10 images on that checkout? Like, what happens then? Or if, if you do it and then you start doing something else and you want to come back to it, like what now, what, zero, ten? Like, it, it just becomes messy. So don't, don't be too creative on the names. Just try to attach a unique number to it. It helps a lot when you're communicating with the client, when you're communicating with developers, that you can say that it's this ID, this is the page I'm talking about. Not the article listing with the line listing, you know, the one, you know, it's like, uh, what? No, I don't. Uh, forms, we talked about that a bit, but one thing to think about is, for example, what are required fields? What are non-required fields, like optional fields? Where will you put error messages? Like here, it's like, what, where will you put them? Uh, in this case, it grows. But it's something to think about as well. It's the sad path kind of thing. And uh, it's something that you should have in that form that I was talking about earlier, just to sign that, that you have all those cases. I don't know why I'm so obsessed with forms. I think our patients a lot, and we have so much trouble with them. Uh, it could be that. <coughs> and then we had, for example, load and reload. And this is something that we really didn't think about um, at all while doing the wireframes. But something I noticed while I was doing the HTML, and that is, when do we do a full refresh on the page? And when do we do just a small reload on the side? For example, on this one, anything that has a list on the left, and then the contents of that list to the right. You can't expect it to work like Gmail, right? That you click and it just loads here, not just does a whole reload. That feels a bit old. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that is something that, how do we communicate this in a wireframe? Like, it, it's a static image. But that's where we'll get to the next topic, which is prototypes. And that's where prototypes help. If you do use, for example, a dynamic panel, you'll see that when you click this, it doesn't do a whole page refresh, it just changes the image. But that is something else you can have with annotations and things like that. But it's something to think about. That's really part of the user experience. Uh, will people be able to bookmark into this page? Will people actually have to wait for a whole refresh for this page? Or you have to think about things like if you're logged in and you're going to log in, then maybe you can't do just a partial reload, you need to do a full reload. You'll have to talk to the developer sometimes, I guess, but that, that's something to really think about. So as I mentioned, prototypes. Um, my basic takeaway is do it. Uh, that's the best thing we did in the project, that we did a prototype. And a prototype is basically a clickable wireframe. It doesn't need to be that advanced, but it should, should show a lot of things that you expect that people understand. Like it's really easy to sit there and like, well, of course this is gonna work like this. It's autocomplete in the search field. Duh. 
but maybe it's not that obvious. Like developers might not pick that up. So the first thing is do prototypes, and that helps you test with the people. You can test it internally. You know it that the interaction isn't quite as smooth as you wanted it to be. But also you can have it available online. So we used AgShare, which puts the wireframe online, and then that wireframe because not just available, but you can update it at any time. So anyone with that link will always have the latest version of those wireframes, which helped us a lot because if you put it on, have you ever had to put it on SharePoint? Like put your documents into SharePoint and then somebody downloads it and then you change it and the people implement the old thing and you're like, why are you doing this old thing? And it's like, but it's on SharePoint. Yeah. And it's, oh, it doesn't work, I, oh, I hate it. Um, so just make it available. And create components. I already said this, but if you're making a prototype, then it's really important that you create components for it, uh, that make a page based on little things that you can reuse. Um, you can think about graceful degradation and progressive enhancement. There's so much touchy feelings into those words that I won't go into it. And just basically, like if you have the number field, some browsers will render like this, and some browsers will render like this, and you're trying to and it looks like this, your wife does this, it's wrong. It's like, well, no, shut up. <laughs> that's, that's the best argument. Now, I will get to that, we'll get to uh, talk about management. And then developers, developers, developers. Uh, it's really important to get those wireframes to the developers really early on and walk you through them. Maybe they'll help you find out what's what you can't do, or something that for some reason you shouldn't do, or in the previous version of the web page you did something else. It could be anything. So it's it, it's been really helpful to go through it with the developers and have them understand how it works, because they're the ones that are gonna implement it. So then it really helps if they really know how it should work. So here we go, management. Um, get them to understand the limitations of browsers. That was the first battle we took. Like they wanted Explorer 7, and mind you, this was the beginning of last year, so Explorer 7 was kind of okay, like, I mean, sorry, I did not mean that, it's, it's never been okay, but it was available, a lot of people had it, and we, pro we just figured that the way it's progressing now, and with the launch of Windows 8, it's probably going to be less than 5% by the time we release, so shouldn't care much about it, and if you want it, it's going to take twice as much time to implement. Like if you want, we can make it, but it's going to be a lot more expensive. Uh, so try to help them understand that browsers are different. And if they expect the exact same look and feel, which they usually do, that that's going to cost a bit more. Uh, a lot of people just think it's OK to assume that it's going to be the same all the time. Uh, it's, I don't think it is. I think there should be a small difference between browsers like there's always is. The font rendering is one thing, how they do with margins from the toolbar and all that, it's always different. So just help them understand that from the start, because then you can focus more on the usability issues rather than, oh, the low is two pixels to the right. And get them to act, uh, give you access to the users. Like in our case, they were freaked out that, oh my god, you're going to talk to the users. No, they might say something bad. It's like, yeah. That's why you want to talk to them. Uh, and uh, it was really hard. Uh, we were finally able to get it. And it was like, oh, there's so many small histories. Like, one thing we noticed, one of their, their clients really, really, really wanted us to have, uh, I'll just call it plans, so I don't give it up too much. But they wanted plans because a lot of users use that. And we did some user tests and talked to them, like, okay, do you use it? How do you use it? And it turned out that basically putting an article to your plan and then buying it from there is easier than putting it into your cart and buying it from there. So people are just using plans because the regular flow sucked, not because they wanted plans. Um, and that is something that if we knew that a bit earlier and could convince management that people are not using plans, we shouldn't wait six months developing a new version of the plan. Uh, so it depends on what company you come from. I guess our, our size is a bit different where the client 
doesn't want their subcontractors or whatever to talk directly to a client, especially when that client is buying stuff from them. Like if you're gonna ask them what is bad about that page, then yeah, maybe your client doesn't want people to to hear you talk bad about them. Um, and then getting to sign off functionality on wireframes, that was something that helped us. Like yeah, we had a lot of requirements documents and a lot of stuff like that. And basically, when it comes to how things work, it was a lot more useful to get them to look at the prototype and say, this is okay and this is not okay, than get them to sign off on requirements documents. And then, uh, the same with the design. Uh, get them to uh, accept the design from the browsers instead of a Photoshop mockup. Because Photoshop mockups can always look really insanely good, like the font rendering is awesome and you can get some special shadows and a lot of effects that will... You might be able to get it into the browser but it might be slow. For example, having a big drop down shadow around the whole page can make scrolling really slow. But it wasn't, uh, why, it wasn't the Photoshop I wanted. Uh, so try to get them to sign off on what they see in the browser instead and get them to accept that and talk around that. So this is actually my last part. So I think you'll have a little extra beer uh, on the house. Uh, so this is, this is the part where I actually did most of the work or like when you had to implement it in HTML. So this is where you think about for people implementing or if you're going to implement it yourself. One of the things we had was offline HTML or like we could run the page without a server. Uh, that might not sound that awesome but it was actually quite good when you have a really big system that you could run the mockups or the implementation of the website locally. And it helps a lot with testing things like how it's going to work when, for example, when we couldn't get the price in our service. So you couldn't get the price and what should happen? Like you should get an error message and all that. So that's something to try to have. And I'll get back to it in a minute. Something we did, which was really nice, was use font icons. And I know this is a religious war between font icons and SVGs. I also have a Mac, so all PC lovers can go there. Um, and I like font icons because you get a lot of stuff on a really small footprint. And you can do simple things like you can add shadow to them or you can put a round box around it or you can make it one color. Uh, but you can do a few things with just CSS and you can make it any size you want. So that, uh, another thing that made me like it was we could install the font. We used font also. So if you install it, you can use it in your wireframes as well. So you have it as a, just a font and then you can copy paste these icons into your wireframes and you use the exact same in the implementation. Because that was something that, like the artist will make a little font, but then no one would actually make an SVG version of it. So <laughs> it helped to have something that was already done. Uh, something that helped us was asking for URL flags. So for example, when we visited the page, we had two different themes. And to change the theme, you had to log in as an administrator into some cockpit and change there and then go back and I look at things and then I'll switch them. So we just made a flag that theme equals and the, the theme we wanted and it would just load the page for that theme. And that was really useful. So we could have two tabs open and uh, keep working like that. Another thing we had is when we did JavaScript that you could add just debug equals true to any page and it would just start spitting out a lot of debug data that you could look at and debug things that weren't working correctly. And then my favorite was the offline mode. Uh, all the services could work offline with pretend data that works. So you could always test the page like it should work. Because sometimes there might be a bug on the integration server or whatever that for some reason you can't look at this page right now. But you can still design it if you went offline. And my last tip was to start with a flat styling. We started with a wireframe looking style that just looked like wireframes. And it helped because then it's really easy to make all these pages. Like it's really quick to just generate pages and make it look like the wireframes and you know that you're on the right track. Um, and when that is done, then you can start adding colors and everything. 
Uh, so that, that was something that really helped us and I'm seeing more and more of that uh, online and other people doing it actually. Um, that was it. Ten minutes early. <laughs> So if there's a list, it's called something list. And if it had a special property, we would add that afterwards, like article list edit, the, the one you could edit. Article list read was a read-only version. Um, article action list, when it's article actions. So try to describe what it is and what it does, and keep it consistent. Like We had a lot of buttons that were called Ajax something. Ajax toggle button, Ajax switch button, Ajax da da da. Uh, so try to find a naming convention that works and that is easy to add stuff to and notice that this is part of the same family but it's different. You, you never add the uh, data you created? Add the data, sorry? No. I guess if it's uh, one version of the wireframes then you don't need to add the, the version. Just no. Yeah, we didn't add any versions to it. Um, that yeah, that's a good point. It, but we kind of solved the version thing with having it online. So just look online to see the latest because it could change any moment. And you wouldn't keep version like the older design. Uh, no, we didn't. Um, it would have just been confusing to explain to people that no, this is version five. We're using version seven. So we just like no online latest. Follow that. Thanks. Yeah? And what were your main reasons for not doing clickable prototypes directly in HTML? Like um, can I just repeat the question for the yeah, do that. online audience? What were your main reasons for not doing clickable prototypes? Directly in directly HTML. HTML. Directly in HTML. Directly in HTML, right. Uh, it started with me and another guy. And um, he wasn't a proficient in HTML. He did the main wireframes, the first wireframes, and I came in to the project to help him. So it was basically skills among the people. And I fully agree, I, I think it, I want to move into that direction, but from my experience, a lot of UX architects aren't that familiar with HTML and CSS to do that. And then you have things like, if, if you want to do a simple interaction, like you click on this drop down and it shows a drop down or autocomplete, then you get into JavaScript territory that you need to know a bit about that. And maybe it doesn't work in your browser, so you need to learn about that. And for some people, their skills aren't programming, it's actually making wireframes. Then it's, uh, it can help to do a wireframe and a wireframing tool. I think it actually all depends on the purpose of what you're doing. And if yeah, you're doing a prototype, what's the project purpose? I'm actually in a project right now where we did a prototype before the summer and now we're going back to wireframes. <coughs> the purpose of the prototype was to actually communicate to the stakeholders this is what we want to build. Now we're going back to wireframes and we're using that to communicate to the developers. Well, I was just wondering if there was a reason that you didn't do the So this was an offshore project. Okay. So there were five time, five hours off in India, <laughs> uh, and I will talk more about what offshore than that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's an interesting question because I think among us all here, we work in different types of projects, and sometimes you're only involved. You're like you're the consultant who has to deliver the wireframes. You're not even in contact with the developers. Which is a shame and probably something you should argue for. But if you're different companies and you, it depends on what the client wants, basically. Just to get back to that question, I think you, uh, one of the things you reacted to was the naming, for example. We just didn't make it clear enough that we have names for these components and we should keep it throughout the project. We just didn't make that clear, so the developers just thought, well, I'll name it whatever I want. 
I don't think this is an article just read. I think this is a linked list alpha, and they call it like that. So it's just making it more clear that we have set a name for it, trying to use that throughout the project. Have you ever tried doing user testing really early with really rough paper and pencil sketches? Yeah. I would highly recommend it. Yeah, 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 we've done that. Uh, in this case, it was the fourth version of an e-commerce site. So it wasn't anything groundbreaking new that we really needed to test like that. It was more the people f understand the pricing model and a few things like that. But absolutely, like uh, in certain projects, it, it makes a lot of sense to do paper wireframes. It also helps the client understand that it won't be ready on Monday. And it might turn out slightly different. Yeah, but it also requires you to be able to show it directly to the client which is not always possible uh, every time. How many people in here do pencil wireframing on paper? Yeah. Wow. Sketching rocks. <laughs> <laughs> for, for yourselves or how many do it for clients? Well, Almost the same. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Content first or wireframes first? Content first or wireframes first? What? <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. I can interpret since this is something we talk about on UX podcast. Okay, yeah, because I'm like, what, uh, if well, you don't have content, why are you doing wireframes? Like, what? Well, that's, the, that's actually the answer I think you want to hear. Yeah, okay, so that's my answer. <laughs> I, think, I think that's a common issue as well. I don't think we expect to do a lot of wireframing before I mean, a project that, like that right now as well. They don't have the content quite just yet. They know we want to communicate this type of stuff and this type of stuff, but I don't even know if they have the resources to do, to do that in the end, but they want the wireframes right now because we want to present the cool stuff down there and the news up here and stuff like that. That's actually something that wasn't on this version of the slides, now that I think of it. Uh, but it was one thing that we had, for example, we thought we had some content, like these are products, so you probably have three, five, pictures of every product, right? So you have the main image and then you have little thumbnails. So we did add a little system for like clicking the images and all that. And then we found out we have zero to one images per product. Uh, so like, oh, dope. Uh, and another thing was that the way you selected uh, how you configure an article from a product, like, yeah, understand that, that takes a while. So articles and products are not the same thing. But anyway, you go into a product and you want to say the size of a paper, like a paper is a product, and then you want to say the size and the weight and all that. And in the previous version, you just had like a huge list of every combination possible. And we're like, oh, we'll just break it up, right? Like, let them choose size first and then weight. I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so we did that. And then we noticed like every product has like 20 attributes. <laughs> so the list was like, this looks good, and it turned out like this. So yeah, content, if, if you can actually get it, I, I don't want to say any names, but you'd be surprised how many clients have no clue about their content or like what they have and don't have. Uh, so even if you talk to them and they say one thing, like when you actually integrate with the service, you go like, what? And the client goes, what? <laughs> so it can be difficult to have the correct content, but absolutely content first. You were actually touching on it, I thought about it when you said that when you had finish words in the menu, you yeah. had contact the line and yeah. you know, but if you I mean if you knew what you were putting there and, and at first you probably have the right amount of space anyway. Yeah. But it's it's a lot of guesswork in that case. Yeah. The people in the back look really relaxed. Yeah. Back <laughs> here. <laughs> I'm wondering a bit about, you were talking about responsive and sometimes it's not natural for all the content to just float down beneath each other, but most people build it like that anyway. Yeah. Does it take, I mean, do you communicate to developers around that? Um, how much extra effort is it to actually put content in a different order based on what screen size you're having right now? 
and how many breakpoints we probably need. Yeah, that really depends on the framework you're using. <laughs> like Twitter Bootstrap has something to move stuff to the left and right of what is already there. And if you build something like that, then I'm sure you can have it. Uh, but we were really creative in the beginning, so we were really like, we'll change this into another thing and we'll move it over here and like make it perfect for every size. And it just took so much time, like we could just not handle it. So it was easier to just admit that, well, things will flow in a certain way, just rethink the position of things and just go with that. And it turned out to work pretty well. We didn't need to do any special cases after that. Okay. But it's, it's how creative you are when you start, I guess. Yeah? Am I just gonna stand here smiling all day? <laughs> <laughs> what about load times? How do you communicate that? I mean, sometimes you're, you wanna build stuff like you're getting creative. Yeah. And you're thinking, well, if this can load in three seconds, then we want to do it. But if it only loads in seven seconds, then we want to do something else. Yeah. Uh, that's when you have to be a bit of a developer. It's yeah. the same with the reload page or just reload a section. Uh, what, what takes the most time? Simple things like just adding a shadow around the whole page can make scrolling slow. Or having some kind of JavaScript that checks the scroll bar makes things slow. It's, I guess, Try, if you can, work close with a developer or be a developer and try to test things out or go by what you've seen on other pages because if you've seen on other pages, it might work for yours as well. I guess it's when you come into like new creative stuff that it can be really difficult. And then it's good if you can communicate it to a developer and have it prototype it really quick and see if that works. Yeah? Uh, did you ever see the final product? <laughs> it's a fine final product. Final product. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Right, next question. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's done from our part, uh, but the page has not been released because of other technical issues. But the front end works nice. <laughs> but that is what I'm waiting for. And that's why I couldn't do so many screenshots of things. I had to take like Amazon and stuff because I can't show what, how it really is. Any question? Uh, yeah. Content first or breakpoints first? <laughs> content first or breakpoints first? I mean, I would almost flip it and have a third option. Like, what, what devices first? Like, if you don't know what devices you're going to have on, what does breakpoints matter? Uh, so, maybe your content works really well. If it's just text, maybe it works well on all devices without doing anything. So I, I, I look at devices, content, and then breakpoints. But is it even possible to look at devices? Do we know what devices are here a year from now? No, that, yeah, that's the interesting thing. Like, we didn't even have the smartphones like today just six years ago. So, of course, but yeah, I guess I, a lot of people, especially me, fall into the trap of thinking of devices like mobile, tablet, PC. Mac, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> TV, yeah, uh, uh, the Retina and all that. But you still need to think of something that is equivalent. Like you still have a screen that size. Maybe it's called something else. Maybe it's taller or smaller. But it's really hard to design for stuff that doesn't exist. Uh, I haven't tried it. I think it's hard. I don't know. Maybe if you have enough beer. Probably, yeah. Foundation uses uh, screen sizes rather than devices. So if you're below some kind of uh, yeah, width or yeah, viewport, then it does something. It yeah, does something yeah, Bootstrap does that as well. Yeah. It has the, the basic thing that most do is you have columns for all sizes, but on the smaller size, it's always max columns. If, even if you set six columns, it'll turn into 12. That is our basic flow. But uh, we learned that having a few more really worked out great uh, for us at least. My recommendation would be start resizing, resizing the browser when it looks like shit, make a breakpoint. Yeah, that, that's the recommendation you usually get and that's what I say no. <laughs> because if you do that, then it's like on this page it looks like shit over here. And on this page it looks like shit over there. Ah. And then you start getting like uh, multiple breakpoints and designs and yeah, it, if you're like me and have to actually implement this, then you're like, screw it, it's not <laughs> that important.
But if you if you just wanna design it, then yeah, you can always find sh shit points. <laughs> shit points. That's excellent. <laughs> That actually makes me think of something else. One column, two columns, or three columns? Twelve. Well, <laughs> well <laughs> no I win. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing a trend moving towards single column websites. Yeah. What's your take on that? I've been so hooked up on an e commerce site where you usually just have one column text and that's stuff. Uh, and I think that, that actually works quite well. If you only have one column text, you don't get com that confused of where to look. But then you can have other stuff around it, like images or ads. I had one question that I actually wrote in the invitation even. Um, is this the night we kill light boxes? Yes. Because that's something that caught my attention when you did your talk before, your 10 minute talk as well. Yeah. The light boxes that we designed into our wireframes, because they were so cool, and you just open it in a light box and you can close it, it's in context. But it works so badly in so many ways, in yeah. so many contexts. How many people have killed light boxes? Not so many. Everybody <laughs> understand the problem with it? Yeah. Like you get a little pop-up and then you try to like see the bottom of the image, but it starts scrolling the background instead. Um, then you try to close it and then just like open some other one and like, ah! So yeah, we really went away from light boxes on our project at least. Yeah. But isn't that an implementation problem rather than uh, a UX problem? <sighs> Will your users think like that? No, but I guess. It is. I mean, I, I'm not disagreeing with you. It is. But you will always have that. Like, there's always going to be a browser or a mobile that doesn't work with this version of Lightbox or whatever. And when your user sits there frustrated, ah, uh, but this is probably because it's a Safari 5.2. And no, 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 that's, no, that's, so that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying sure you're saying there's a right way to do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can do it to make it work. <laughs> or you can have a great relation that actually has the. All, all, maybe I'll say but all the ways I've seen work always breaks when there comes a new update or something and you have to update that library and so for a while it will be broken for a few people like I've never seen anything that works correctly the closest thing you can get is light boxes for images but if you do modal boxes with a button on it or something else not just an image that usually leads to more trouble so simple light boxes can work and can work pretty well, but model boxes is what I'm more afraid of, I guess. Still disagree? <laughs> yes. well, we'll take a fight outside. Well, let's, uh, let's have a beer over that. Yeah. And <laughs> love hearing you talk. These are so many good recommendations, and thank you for that. And. Uh, I was gonna buy you a T-shirt, and you bought the T-shirt yeah. before. Uh, I'll buy you a sweater. Oh, nice! <laughs> Got a whole clothesline. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh yeah, I should get you a, like sweatpants and stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah. What the? One piece. One piece. One piece. Yeah. You oh, like one, one piece. piece. Oh, the yeah. Marshall's one piece. Yeah, if you buy it'll be compulsory for attending the events. I'll, I'll, I'll present it one. <laughs> Thank you so much again, and let's yes. have some beer and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>